Part 1, Chapter 1 of Aleriel, or A Voyage to Other Worlds, by Władysław Lachzimmer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nigel Carrington, London, 2018. Chapter 1 The Hunchback of Mont Saint Gabriel. It was a lovely morning in the June of 1870 when I left the little town of B in Brittany for a walk to the neighbouring hill of Mont Saint Gabriel, where there was a celebrated old chapel, commonly counted as one of the sites of the neighbourhood. I had just left Oxford for the vacation and was refreshing myself after a term's hard work by a walking tour in France. My companion, Galton, had sprained his foot and was staying at the hotel, resting himself for the day. But I was unwilling to miss this opportunity of seeing Mont Saint Gabriel, so I started on the morning's walk of some four kilometres alone. It was a quiet and somewhat desolate route, and many thoughts about the past and future and eternity came unbidden before my mind. But I need not trouble my readers with them, for they have little directly to do with my story. They were, however, afterwards indelibly fixed on my memory. I at length reached the little promontory running into the sea on which Mont Saint Gabriel stands. I climbed over some rocks which bounded the path and made my way up to the picturesque and antique chapel now ruined the view was splendid the blue sea adorned here and there by little ridges of silver foam the wild rocky coast the crying of the seagulls and the low roar of the ocean all tended to awe me and then to quiet my mind into a calm reverie how beautiful is this world i thought i wonder if there is anything that can exceed in loveliness such scenes as these or the glorious alps or the splendid rough cornish coast in a storm or the lake districts of the north this world is very beautiful i am afraid i must have been giving way to the bad habit i sometimes have when quite alone of talking to myself for suddenly I was aroused by a slight rustling behind me. I turned, and a very singular-looking person met my gaze. He was a very short, fair young man, greatly deformed about the shoulders. He was dressed in a common ouvrier's costume, with a large Breton hat and a cloak thrown over his blouse. His face, however, in spite of his coarse costume and manifest deformity, was of exquisite refinement and even beauty. His complexion was fair as a girl's, but pale even to bloodlessness. His eyes, though somewhat obscured by the hat, were most strange and brilliant. His features small and delicate. He had neither moustache nor beard and scarcely looked above twenty he was gazing at the sea and though near me appeared not to notice my presence for several minutes i remained silently looking at the waters with i must own an occasional glance at my companion poor fellow i said to myself what a singular malformation about the shoulders i never saw anything like it before and then how deadly pale he is and so refined in spite of that peasant's dress perhaps he is some gentleman in distress some unfortunate student who has failed in life's battle and then a dreadful thought seized me i hope he is not meditating suicide or he is not mad in either case i am in an awkward position in this lonely spot in a strange country with a madman or one in utter despair but when i looked again at that strange meditating face the thought was dispelled 
he was thoughtful but not at all sad nor was there either the excited or the sullen look of mania about those intellectual eyes but still he looked on silently watching the sea i was immensely puzzled and was getting quite uncomfortable for galton had been entertaining me the evening before with a whole series of horrid breton legends about the white lady and the ghosts and the signs of death and really here was a personage who if he had been met at night might have been easily taken for a revenant but it was not night and the sun was shining brightly and the shadow of this stranger's curious figure was clearly defined on the chapel wall at last i thought it was useless and uncourteous to thus pretend not to heed him and that it would be better to speak so i broke the silence with a polite bow and a bonjour monsieur good morning sir you are english are you not he said in a very sweet and clear contralto voice and a singular but pleasing foreign accent yes i said and am very glad you can talk with me in my native language may i ask also if you are french or a stranger to this country un étranger monsieur he said in french and then relapsed into silence so it was evident that he knew both french and english and was neither french nor english what countryman was he the voice the accent and the manner were as strange as the appearance of my new acquaintance and gave me no clue my question seemed to have silenced him and for several minutes again he appeared to have no wish to renew our conversation at length i broke the silence you speak english well for a foreigner have you ever been in our country never sir but i much wish to visit it i have been told it is a land of liberty and progress that there is much that is noble and good in your country there is a great deal that is sad to see in other parts of europe misery oppression and sorrow i should like to see a happier land in this world perhaps england is such perhaps it is he added after a pause they say your country is rich i hope that the many have the benefit of that wealth and not the few i am afraid we cannot say that there are great disparities in england as in other lands how do you like france i may ask you for you say you are not a frenchman a gay pleasure-loving nation wanting in gravity in stability in religious sentiment france lives too much for the present and not enough for the future not enough in the past it is selfish and proud and pride oftentimes precedes a fall the latin races seem growing effete they have had their day the teutonic races may have the present and the immediate future however i cannot tell the state of germany is sad though not as sad as france the intelligence of his remarks touched me i looked down at his worn and almost ragged trousers it seemed to me sad that one so intelligent and educated should be a mere peasant and in want after some momentary misgivings as i rose to return to b i resolved to do something to aid him i put my hand in my pocket and blushing offered him a five franc piece my dear sir perhaps you want this more than i pardon me in offering it he took it smiled and simply said thank you sir if i can return your kindness i will we may meet again 
Adieu, I said. I hope we may meet again. I bowed and left him still standing, gazing on the sea. End of chapter 1